Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rolf, for the introduction. And uh, as you said, I'll focus on um, Ethiopia and Djibouti and Stratex activities there. Uh, the normal disclaimer, so I won't, uh, won't bore you with that. Just a, a quick overview of Stratex itself. As, as well mentioned, we are also active in Turkey. And uh, within Turkey itself, we have, uh, we have resources, uh, just over one and a half million ounces of gold with silver and uh, copper in one project called Muradera. We have a large range of exploration projects, um, eight in Turkey and a further eight in Ethiopia and Djibouti, which I'll focus on. And a couple of development projects similar to what, uh, what Ariano presented earlier, um, taking small oxide gold resources to production. And likewise, we hope to be producing gold as part of those um, uh, later next year. So the real strength and difference um, of, of Stratus compared to its, its uh, competitors is our quality of our major JV partners. As you can see there, we've got Anglo Gold Ashanti, uh, one of the world's biggest gold producers, Tech, Canada's largest um, um, mining company, Centera Gold, uh, a mid-tier company producing gold in, in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, and Antifagas, also one of the largest copper producers, who's doing a target generation program with us in, in Turkey. And besides being major JV partners, I'd like to stress that both Anglo Gold and Ashanti are equity partners. Anglo Gold recently bought into a 12% stake in Stratex, really on the back of some of the, uh, the discoveries in Ethiopia, which I'll, I'll go through shortly. And Tech has been a founder equity partner from day one, followed their money, and also as a JV partner on our exploration projects, Hassan Shalevi in Turkey. Um, Turkey's moving very well. We've had some very great successes there. Um, the probably most notable this year was a, a, a gold intersection of 220 meters at over two grams at our Oxford project with Centera, which is now developing into what looks like to be a major gold play, and we look forward to updating people on that. And we have other partners there, local groups, uh, NTF and Lighten is as well working with us, whilst Bez is a partner in, in Ethiopia. So again, we've, we've attracted a lot of money um, through our JV partners. It's part of our de-risking our early stage projects by bringing in these partners to help us to develop them, knowing that nine times out of 10, you're gonna walk away from an exploration project because it ain't gonna be there. So don't waste your money, bring somebody in who thinks it is there. And that's a very important part of our, our strategy within Stratex. <coughs> so putting the, into the bigger picture of East Africa, and I did note the Mining Journal um, earlier, this had, earlier this month or last month, in their East Africa um, supplement uh, pooled Egypt Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and, um, and Chad together in that region. So here we are, stuck in what is better known as the Horn of Africa. Uh, Somalia gets into the news for all the wrong reasons, as we know, um, with piracy and also due to um, severe famine conditions. Ethiopia and Djibouti stuck here right in the corner. Just closing on Ethiopia, to get a little bit of background, Addis Ababa is the capital, population just over 19 million people. The size of the country, um, really to put that in perspective, we're looking at the equivalent of Colombia and South America. So it's a big area, large country, big geological potential. Uh, the government, Federal Republic, uh, it's actually growing very fast. There's a lot of investment coming into Ethiopia. Uh, Addis is full of new buildings, there are new roads, and the country, every time you land at the airport, is, is moving on a step as it, as it progresses in its, um, in its evolution. The company is active besides ourselves, Nyata Minerals, also aim listed with the Tula Capital Project, Midrock, which is an Ethiopian and Saudi venture, Sentiment Egypt, who recently bought into Sheba Exploration with one of our partners, Tigray Resources is a new Canadian company, a spin off from Canico, they've got action in the north, and then there's a big potash play, um, probably not well known to a lot of people in the Dalol Depression, which involves Alana Potash, BHP Billiton, and Ethiopian Potash Corp. So a huge country, very historical, not very little known about it until really the last few hundred years because these are the Ethiopian highlands, over 2,000 meters, very rugged, and for a long time was very remote and hard to get into. So it's a country that's been sort of lost in time a little bit. Fascinating history, one of the earliest Christian areas, and if you get to Axum in the north, you can actually get as close as you're ever going to get to, to the Ark of the Covenant, because that's where they believe it is. So uh, fascinating history. Very diverse cultures, very diverse languages, with Alice in the base and the highlands. Closing in on Djibouti, considerably small, as you can see, about the size of Wales, a minute country. And essentially, this is the port to Ethiopia. Djibouti port, 
served. Everything that comes into Ethiopia comes through there and is driven on the main roads um, up, to, up to the capital. There used to be a railway line that's currently been um, re-looked at and hopefully will be restarted, but that's a major project to come up. In terms of mineral exploration, there's only a, a, an Indian group known as JB, we don't know much about them, and ourselves. And we went in on the back of our, our, um, our epithermal play, which I'll, I'll fill you in on. Why was our original interest in Ethiopia? Well, there's a, a block of geology called the Arabian Nubian Shield, um, which stretches over Saudi, um, Egypt, Sudan, right down into, into Ethiopia and part of it in Yemen. It's probably most famous at the moment for the Sentamin Sukari gold mine, over 13 million ounces in, in the uh, eastern desert of Egypt. Um, but also there's been considerable exploration done in the 80s by uh, Rio Phoenix and the USGS in Saudi Arabia, which resulted in a number of gold discoveries, but probably biggest and best is Mahadab, which has been producing about 100,000 ounces of gold, at under $200 an ounce now for oh, well over 15 years. And then most recently in Sudan, the Hassai deposit, which was originally found by the BRGM, then they were taken over by Newmont. Newmont actually did at, run the mine in Sudan, not known to many people. Again, it produced about 130,000 ounces for a number of years, very low cost oxide gold. And that is now being developed by La Mancha Resources in, um, in uh, joint venture with the, with the Sudanese government. And then moving into Eritrea, where there's been a lot more activity, certainly from uh, the Canadian side, you have uh, Bisha with Nevsun. Um, Sunridge Resources with Ember Derhu, another massive sulfide, Chalice Gold with Zara, as you can see there, and a number of other players have been going in there recently, has had a lot of activity. Though, uh, as the announcement last week, with, with threats of, um, of sort of sanctions against the country by the World Bank, by the UN, uh, the politics may be a little bit dubious going forward. In terms of base metal potential, um, I mean, the biggest not marked here is Jibal Said, which is now 30 million tons of 2% copper originally developed or explored by Citadel with the Saudis. Uh, then they were bought out by Equinox, and then Equinox bought out by Barrick. That's now in the hands of Barrick Gold. What they'll do with it, I'm not too sure. It's not really their cup of tea, but we'll see. But that's the biggest sort of base metal resource. And then we come down here into, into Ethiopia, and you can see this large block of highland ground with the two main projects, Le Le Legadembi, which is operated by Midrock, um, over 3 million ounces past production and uh, resources. Little known about it uh, overall, it's a, it's, a, it's a private company. And then Tula Kappa, which uh, Nyato Minerals is developing in the West, uh, currently indicating inferred resources of 1.2 million ounces. And putting our, our projects into perspective, we focus up here in the north, in the Tigray region, which is a direct extension of the geology from Eritrea. And then we're looking at this area here, which I'll lead you into. We consider all of these countries, but really for legal, fiscal, or security reasons, they weren't really worth investigating. Egypt is a production sharing agreement, it's 50-50 with, with the government, um, not very easy. I was there, worked there 20 years ago, they haven't changed the code, so I wasn't prepared to take Stratix back in a code I walked away from. Yemen, political reasons and security now. Saudi, very difficult to get licenses, a long time frame, long time wait, and not an easy place to operate. Sudan, again, has its, uh, it, it's uh, hard to get licenses, though they are issuing them now, but again, there are security issues. And then Eritrea, I felt we were a bit laid in. So we came down to focus on Ethiopia, and that really was um, a pleasant surprise for us. So really there, why we chose it, favorable geology, the Arabian Nubian Shield, but also the East African Rift, clearly underexplored in terms of what the Arabian Nubian Shield had been done in other countries, even though even though in those other countries it's still a hugely unexplored terrain where I'm sure there'll be a lot more discoveries made in the, in the future. Um, very much an open door policy in Ethiopia, a good, good friendly regime, um, open door policy, easy to get licenses, uh, corporate tax there, 35%, tax free importation, transparent code through from exploration to mining, uh, and the government does take a 5% stake, though, in, in the mining stage, not at exploration. But we've rapidly built up a land position in, in under two, just over two years now. We've got all the licenses we want. It's a straightforward application and a matter of time before you receive it, as long as the ground is open. <clears throat> but taking away from the Arabian Nubian Shield, which led us in, we did have another project, which we started off about three years ago, which truly was a concept at the time when Turkey was developing, we thought where we would take Stratex next. And uh, we decided we, at that time we started looking for a new gold province, not looking for a singular project. Where could you possibly find a whole new gold province that you can get into, make the discovery, and acquire all the discoveries yourselves? 
quite a big task. Linking up with Dr. Richard Silito, a uh, well-known consultant, and myself and Bob with our ideas, really basing on, on the idea of, um, of the rift settings, which are well known for bonanza-type uh, epithermal gold in other areas, but no one had ever really looked, and there were no known gold occurrences in the Rift Valley prior to the start of our work. And in a short time since October 2009, that frontispiece, that first picture, was the Alaveda Hot Springs, where um, we, were, we were driving back from, myself and Dan, in October 2009, when we stumbled across what we'd been looking for for two years, and that was a fully preserved, low sulfidation epithermal system carrying gold in the Afar Depression. Straight away, we've been able to de-risk that early, early on with Thani Ashanti as a partner. Thani Ashanti is the Middle Eastern joint venture of Anglo Gold Ashanti with the Thani Group, which is a major conglomerate based out of Dubai. So they come in and on the first discovery, we've already completed 3,000 meters of drilling. But we didn't stop on that. We've extended the, the, the work and we've now gone down and done exploration in Djibouti. And the total land package is over 3,000 square kilometers. You can imagine that's a huge play um, early days when, when you've already made the first discovery in an area where there actually was no known gold whatsoever. And we've had further licenses now, which includes the Black Rock one, which I'll lead you on to just shortly. Sort of putting the, uh, the Afar Epithermal Province into, into perspective, this is a unique geological area. This is a triple junction. It's actually where the African continent is currently being ripped apart in a rift setting. Um, very, very active um, in terms of recent volcan volcanism and everything. Um, and a lot, of, um, a lot of recent geological features. And these are the areas, the magenta discovery down here in Tendaho. Uh, these are other gold discoveries that we've got, outcropping gold in epithermal veins. And then right up here, nearly 300 kilometers to the north in the Danakil Depression, we have the new Black Rock discovery where we're just about to commence drilling very shortly. So it's a massive province, and please bear that in mind when I bring you to a similar area where we believe we have a, a, an opportunity uh, to, to make comparisons with. This is uh, the Thani Asante joint venture. It's the very first discovery in Magenta. We got them in early, five licenses in Ethiopia and six early licenses in Djibouti. Uh, they've been funding $3 million over two years to run 51% of those particular licenses. The first year commitment is over. They drilled the 3,000 meters at Magenta. This is a view of the magenta. These are the, uh, the basalts in the background with the uh, big grab and faults. So these are the silica ribs sticking out of the desert, which are telling us that these are fluid conduits for hydrothermal, epi uh, epithermal um, gold system. Uh, when they progress, we're moving to the second year now. At the end of two years, for them to earn 70% in any particular license. So they could take one license, they've got to spend four million. They take two licenses, eight million. So again, they were the chance that we have all the funding of this early stage project um, for $7 million on each license, hopefully, um, by, by our partner. And then in the meantime, that's allowed us to accrue a lot of knowledge on what this province is all about and help us to vector our new targets. This is the drilling of magenta, and this is what we wanted to see. These are classic epithermal veins, which you see in many places. So examples from the Desiata Massif, which I'll show you, Hishikari, the highest gold, gold grade mine in the world. And the thing about, banana, about bimodal rift settings is, for some reason, geologically I won't go into detail, is they're well known for these bonanza grades. Bonanza grades being greater than one ounce per tonne. So we're looking for high grade, um, small tonnage um, style deposits in, in these particular systems. And we've early stage uh, interesting values. They're very thin, unfortunately, but the gold is there. And the thing about this particular system, it is totally and utterly preserved. There is no erosion whatsoever. So we've now realized that we're just touching the top of the system with this first round of drilling, and we'll be looking to go deeper in, in the second round of drilling um, where we start it shortly, uh, hopefully next year. Moving 300 kilometers to the north, this is a discovery of uh, what we could term black rock. And here, as against the top of the system, we believe we're right down in, in, in the key gold, gold part of the system, where we're actually getting outcropping uh, large veins. We've, we've got surface samples going over an ounce per ton in some of the veins. This is a very extensive zone of mineralization, four zones. That stretches about 20 kilometers. And this, this gives you a picture of the black water zone, which is just the one zone here. And within this, we've, we've got over seven kilometers of outcropping veins um, at surface which we've now mapped and we are about to embark on drilling. And the good thing about this is, you know, we were actually, we have a, we have a license in the Arabian Nubian Shield just to the um, west of here, 
And it was our two geologists who'd been working in Magenta who had been over at the Alana Potash camp, because it was the big place to get decent food, because our camp was pretty basic at the time. They were coming back one, from the evening and they saw a large prominent rib sticking out. They drove two kilometers off the dirt road, cracked it open, and Bob's your uncle, another epithermal vein. We weren't actually looking up here because we'd been focusing down around Magenta. This is what really opened up the AFR as an area, and a big area of, of epithermal veins. So scale now, in these two zones, we've nearly got 15 kilometers we've mapped. Um, the, the main zone here, Theodore, is where we're going to start drilling in mid-November. We planned a 3,000 meter program with, uh, with uh, 5,000 meters in total initially, but we're looking at a 10,000 meter program going straight in on this, on this project. Numerous veins. They, are, they carry all the classical epithermal textures that tell you that you're in the gold deposition zone. So we're, we're highly excited by this, and certainly opens up what becomes a make, we believe is a, totally is a new epithermal province now. And this is a view of, of that black water, black water zone. This is the, uh, the Theodore vein here, and you can see the outcropping veins right holding up this ridge line here. Uh, that's over a kilometer long. A number of veins up to five in places with silicified material between the veins, which also carries gold. So we're looking at, in this case, zones up to 25 meters wide, um, hopefully giving us a good width. Uh, as of grades, we'll have to wait and see till we drill. Uh, looking down this valley here is, is what's the oasis vein. There's a, there's a low-lying vein that comes right through the middle here. Just down here is a very mild, weakly hot spring. So there has been um, geothermal activity here in recent past. And then this big rib line here is, is the Nesbitt vein, which we're currently mapping and sampling. We'll be moving the drill rig onto that um, once we've completed the Theodore drilling. Our aim here is to test this structure down to 150 meters along its one kilometer strike. Uh, hopefully looking at a zone with somewhere between 5 or maybe up to 20 meters, we don't know if we drill it, but we do have excellent values along this zone showing broad um, values up 25 meters over a gram, and within that when you sample some of the veins, particularly in the banded veins, is where we're seeing over an ounce per ton. So it's a very exciting project, and uh, I'm back out there next week just to, uh, to uh, check on the drill sites and the drill rig, hopefully will be arriving very shortly. But we expanded the play to Djibouti, a Djibouti a country which nobody say, really knows anything about. Um, the geology is the same, we followed it down there, and in doing our reconnaissance work, we've now found uh, outcropping gold occurrences. This is a rhyolite dome with up to three grams of gold in it. That is the, uh, the Asal Rift, the lowest point in the African Rift Valley, minus 150 meters below sea level, uh, currently mined on a small scale of salt. And uh, we are standing up here, probably about minus 50 meters below sea level, but still with these outcropping um, rhyolite domes, very young, but certainly gold-bearing, and that's one of our targets for regional follow-up in the coming months. So why, why is this um, so exciting? Well, this is the uh, this is Desiado Massif, um, the Saravang Raja gold mine, which is operated by our partners, Anglo Gold Ashanti, so they should know what they're talking about. This is over 6 million ounces of gold, but this area, 20 years ago had no known gold occurrences whatsoever. It was not seen as a gold province, and Saravanguardia was the first discovery made back in the late 80s, early 90s, put into production in 1997 by Anglo Gold. Since then, as you can see, a, a large number of um, uh, new deposits have come up, including Cerro Negro, um, some higher silver ones, Manasel Spetho, Minamatha, San Jose, New discovery is Los Calandres, which is linked with, uh, with Mariana Resources, you know, another A-listed company. That is a rhyolite dome setting, very similar to that picture I just showed you from Asal. And uh, Patagonia Gold, another company on AIM, um, is also active in this area, and they've been producing high-grade intercepts. The geological setting is, is exactly the same. This, this was created by the opening up of the Atlantic Ocean, so it's a rifting setting, whereas we're in an early stage of a continental rift uh, breaking up in, in, in East Africa. What's nice is, and just shows you how people like it, Gold Corp acquired Cerro Negro uh, only last year for $3.6 billion, which put a value of about $1,000 an ounce per, per resource ounce at the time when they acquired it. It's now gone up to, uh, I think it's over 4 million ounces that they're proving up. But so as you say, you can find something big and new, um, you know, the, 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 the major gold partners are going to be out there looking at you very seriously. And that's why we believe the FR. We were first in, we found it, we made all the discoveries, and we secured ground over all the discoveries. 
So we've got over 12 epithermal occurrences to follow up. So uh, a very unique position. I've never been in it before, and I'll tell you, it's, it's a very exciting thing to be involved with at the moment. Coming back to the Arabian Nubian Shield and, and uh, where we sort of started, uh, we do have these projects, and I won't put them down at all. Shahagni is, uh, was our first project owned by a, a plus a company called Sheba, who were then taken out um, just recently by Sentamin, uh, evidently looking for a new place to take their expertise after developing Sukari. Um, we're earning 60% um, of that project by spending £350,000. We've just completed that, including a 1,000 meter drill program. Uh, we've also looked at a local partner, Lars Bez, down here, where we've got some early stage, um, highly encouraging, high-grade gold and silver from, from quartz veins over a big area. We're currently following that up. And then the, uh, the Berahali and Tigre licenses are very, very big areas where we're doing regional stream sediment sampling and initial targeting to find, uh, hope to find drill targets. And that Berahali license is where the guys are working when they were driving across to make the Black Rock discovery. Again, our land package in this area is over 3,000 square kilometers. So you can see we've got a lot of ground which we've been able to pick up very early, which is why one of the reasons why we're delighted to get into Ethiopia, to be able to hopefully get in there and make early gold discoveries that we have done, and uh, hopefully make a really big one, uh, which will like, attract the likes of our partners, like Angler Gold of Shanti. Shahagni is a, is a, is a very well, you know, low-grade bulk target. This is one of our um, channel chip trenches on, on the roadside here. This is in the highlands over 2,000 meters. Access is pretty difficult. That's why we focused on the first drill program on this road. There's our drill section, 1,000 meters, five holes, testing this zone of mineralization down to about 150, 200 meters vertically. As you can see from the grades, 84 meters of the gram, 104 meters, 0.77. It is big, bulk mineable, low grade. If we can repeat those intersections, in these drill holes, this will move on to being an interesting target, at which point we are 60 40 with sentiment, and we will sit down with them and see how we can progress it. So that's our key project in Arabian Nubian Shield. Um, the results of that come out shortly. And say so with Black Rock, we start, we'll be starting drilling in, in uh, mid November, hopefully, and then we'll be building up the other targets with a follow up drilling funded by Thani Ashanti in Magenta. We have another target very close to Magenta where we've got outcropping, sorry, where we've got float samples of quartz veins going up to 59 grams. We just haven't been able to find the source of those yet. Um, we'll have field teams out doing that as well. So a, a huge, a huge play, um, quite a unique play as I said, and one I think is very exciting and uh, we will wait to see what comes out of the Black Rock drilling and what that tells us about the other properties we have within it. So really it is a frontier region and um, thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed for a very uh, interesting presentation. Are there any questions from the floor? <coughs> yes, please. Yes. Name and company, please. Uh, Gerald Shane, Cameron Tango. Uh, I'm interested, you talked about uh, earlier slides with joint ventures, yep. where people get to 70%. Uh, who then funds from, uh, once they get to 70%, one of them was about six million pounds in total. How do you do the next lot of funding? And if they decide not to carry on funding, what happens to their equity? Well, I mean, 70 30, we always retain 30%. There is no, unless we want to contribute our dilute down at that point. So the idea is that once you spend six or seven million on a project, which is free expiration in terms of dollars for us, you're going to have a much higher level of confidence in what is there. It may not be quite a resource stage, it may, may be. And that, with that in hand, it's easier to go raise money than say, give us $8 million to drill on something we don't know what's there yet. So the idea, when you get to 30%, with that expiration, you should be able to go with a greater level of confidence to the market and say, we really do have something here. And so if your partner, who's got 51%, stops funding, yep. he keeps his 51%? No, if we feel it's a small, it doesn't meet their size criteria, for example, Anglo Gold would be looking for 3 million ounces plus, and they say, no, we don't want to go any further. We can then say, well, we, we can see, for example, we can see half a million ounces, which we feel we can get value out of and maybe even put it in production like we've done in Turkey. Uh, and then we, we, we can dilute them down. So very quickly, 40, what, 51 to 49, and we go in for say, well, we're going to spend $2 million. We get back to the majority position and control the property. And, and, and the value is determined by the amount. So if you put $6 million in for, for 51%, you're going to get about 12 yeah. And that's set out in your form. That's set out your stand. There's a standard contribute or dilute clause that allows you to, to dilute the other partner if they don't contribute. At a degree valuation. 
No, at the valuation they put in. So you say they put in six million, therefore that, that basically the 49% will be whatever it is, 5.75. So it works well. And what it allows you to do is play, means you can play lots of plays. So nine times out of 10, I mean, expiration, I've said this many times, you know, not finding an economic deposit is a norm in our business. That's a fact. So you've got to get out there and have lots of plays out there. And by doing this, we get lots of plays. But also, I think, hopefully, by showing the quality of the partners we have, they're, they're backing the fact that we are a good geological team. We make discoveries. And they're prepared to partner us on the early stage. Don't forget, if that goes to 70, 30 on, on say, a 5 million ounce discovery, you know, we, we've got ourselves 1.5 million ounces. And we've, we've been free carried for $8 million. That, that's, that's the prize. As against BlackRock, I will stress, and I stated when we first made the discovery, we've been looking for the one, and people have said to us, and rightly or wrongly, that well, you always give it away very early on. Well, in the case of BlackRock, technically we sat down and said, this one is so good, we're not going to do it. We're going to do it ourselves. And that says, I hope, says something about our belief in how good BlackRock is and what it may, implications it may have for us and the FR and Stratex as a whole. Any other questions from the floor? Uh, yes, please. <coughs> you said right at the start that you decided that Eritrea you were too late to go into. Yet three of your targets on the Arabian Nubian shield, namely Shehan, Shehaki, Tigre, and Burra Hale, yep. are sitting just on the Ethiopian side of the border. Yep. Surely it makes sense for you to hop across it to Eritrea. Well, again, as I said earlier, I mean, we were able to go in and get those licenses, put the applications in, whereas in Eritrea, it's more of a project-by-project project basis negotiate with the government. Uh, on the other side, where we are, the main player is Sunridge Resources. They've got, say, there are two massive sulfides, Ember Dehu, and another one which they're talking about the development at the moment. They briefly had a joint venture um, with Antofagasta, who subsequently pulled out. I'm not sure of the reason on that. So it, it, we, we saw that, but we, we took the geology and said, hey, that's, that's, is it the same geology on the Ethiopian side, which we believe it is, and that's why we were able to we focused there. And we were able to get the licenses um, quickly and, and, say, get ourselves to a drill stage in Shahagni and follow the other things up. So, again, you can't be everywhere. And, and actually, to be honest, I mean, operating in Ethiopia and Eritrea, because of their histories, um, they're not the best of friends. So it's probably a bit better to work in one rather than the other. And also, if you want to go from Addis to Asmara, You've got to fly to Yemen, Cairo, or Frankfurt, even though it's only up the road. Any other questions? Yes, please. Name company, please. Are you experiencing some uh, security issues in uh, working in this area for your expats? And if yes, how do you address that? <laughs> we we've had no no instance whatsoever um, up in Tigray. It's uh, even though we're we're very close to the Eritrean border, there is a we, an area we don't go to. Uh, but we've had no problems again. It's a simple community relations going in very early on, meeting the local chiefs, employing the locals. Uh, certainly up in Tigray, very friendly people, no, no, no doubt about that. In the FR and the Danikil, as Rob sort of put his introduction, and Wilfred Thessinger did say they weren't the most violent people in the world, and they like to take certain prizes off, off, off men, which I won't say what they are. But uh, those days are gone. It's, it's a very... It's a developing region at the moment because of that potash play. BHP built on spending 20 million bucks on the potash, which is right adjacent to our BlackRock license. They're building new roads. There's going to be a, a major road building going on. So even though you, you think you're now in the middle of nowhere, it, it is a bit like a, a, a building site in terms of the amount of roads being built to support the potash, which the government is very keen to develop, even though and those are going to be major projects. It's going to be three, four billion capex. Again, very remote. We have a, you do have guards, and again, you use, you use the local people for that. Really, that's more fitting in and employing the people rather than, than a security risk. Um, I, we've driven around and uh, been by ourselves as well with locals, and I can tell you wholeheartedly, and I've done a lot of work there, I haven't had a single problem yet. Okay, any other questions from the floor? Okay, in which case, David Hall, thank you very much indeed.